El Nino is crossing the final hurdle. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, September 10th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You'll get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you'd like to make a donation, you can. Just hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Tim Caston, Don Mandrotten, Elliot Harris, Frank Frost, Lloyd Morrison, Gary Niblock, Coach Nate, Jason Odom, thank you, Jason, and Opisha. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your contribution. And with that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. Yes, it's September and we're still looking down south. That is attributable to the six-week stall in seasons brought on by three years of La Nina. We think, or at least we're hoping, that we're going to bust through that door pretty soon and get into a more seasonal pattern but maybe not for a couple more weeks. We're thinking maybe the end of September. Anyway, small gale has produced 23-foot seas here east of New Zealand, really of no concern, and there's nothing else going on in the South Pacific. Next up, current conditions. We'll start in Northern California. The Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's currently hitting that buoy from anywhere up at 33.3 second super long period energy, and you see zero feet, no energy there. Little bump here somewhere in the 11 to 12 second range. That's uh, from Hurricane Hova, and then some local wind swell down in the six to five second period range. It's basically five seconds. It's basically unrideable chop. Six seconds is about where we start saying the chop is semi-rideable. Uh, putting that all together, we see primary swell 2.9 feet at 12.2 seconds from 169 degrees. So shadowed for most, but the most exposed breaks, that'd be surfing about the three and a half foot range. And that's about what's going on. And then you have your wind swell 3.8 feet at 5.8 seconds from the northwest, 323 degrees. And then we're going right to Southern California, the Point Loma South Buoy, number 191. Same sort of profile, little bits of uh, the tropical swell energy here at about 10 seconds, something like that, with some wind swell mixed in. Put that together, 3.5 feet at 10.5 seconds from 164 degrees. That's surf at about 3.7 feet, we'll say waist to stomach high, something like that. And really, nothing else going on. And then finally, to the south shore of Oahu, the Barber's Point buoy number 238, we see not even that much going on. A little bump here at 16 seconds, it's like half a foot, and a bunch of wind swell mixed in. Primary swell, two feet at 8.2 seconds from 166 degrees, so just pretty much unrideable wind swell, thigh high, something like that. And there's your uh, longer period energy, 0.9 feet at 16.5 seconds, one and a half feet, making for thigh high surf on the south shore. But it's not all doom and gloom. We're going to go back in time. We're starting on 0Z Sunday, the 3rd of September. So that's really uh, Saturday night, the 2nd of September, all, a week ago. Um, a little gale push, oh, New Zealand here, Australia here. Ross Ice Shelf, this is Antarctic ice going the whole way across. There's Peru, Chile, and Galapagos Islands, and the equator right there. So a little gale pushed under New Zealand on Sunday. Really didn't do a whole lot. Seas, 24.2 feet. These are the highest seas over the entire domain. You see the little plus sign. It's sitting right there in the middle of that sea so that we know that's the area that we're looking at. Really, that's not enough to create enough of a period of a swell to push north of the equator. So not a whole lot. But then on Tuesday, the 5th of September, the system got better organized with 28-foot seas building to 31 feet and a little bit more. We got 
35 feet theoretically over maybe one pixel there in the image. And again, 34 feet as we got into Wednesday, the 6th of September. Uh, the Southern California cutoff over here at about 117 west. So those seas faded. A little bit more energy circulated into about Thursday, and that was over. Swell from that system is pushing north for mainly southern and north California, Hawaii, pretty much east of, uh, or the fetch was east of Hawaii, so no swell expected there. And then we fast forward to this morning, or actually Saturday night, another little gale tried to organize, or was trying to organize, only 23 foot seas, there we go, 24 foot seas, and that was it. This system previously is forecast, even like four days ago, was forecast to have up to like 30-foot seas aimed north. And then sometime uh, between Friday and Saturday, it all just fell apart. And so no swell is expected from that. So one is queued up, pushing north. Now we got to go look to see if there's something in the forecast looking ahead. But before we do that, we're going to take one quick look. Hurricane Hova down here developed on uh, Tuesday night, the 5th of September. You can see it here. It built with pretty decent-sized seas. It really followed a track very similar to Marie back in 2014. But the fetch area, nowhere near as big. The swell, as a result, nowhere near as big. Yeah, there were, what, a foot or two overhead waves, something like that, down at top spots in Southern California yesterday on Saturday. That swell, you saw it on the buoys, is already fading out, you know, with period in the 10 to 11 seconds. Really, this wasn't a great swell producer. A hurricane needs to be traveling more north then off to the west. It needs to have a big fetch area. It can have a lot of winds. This system got up to, I don't know, I don't remember, 140, uh, 140 mile an hour wind, something like 125, 130 knots. Um, but again, very small fetch area. It's like throwing a pea really hard into a swimming pool and trying to get some ripples out of it, where if you have a much larger system, a cinder block, and you gently throw it into the pool, you'll get a lot bigger effect. So in this case, size matters. So let's look forward. We're going to start at jet stream, looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a push in the jet to the north, just like right there. What that helps do is create a clockwise circulation, an eddy in the upper atmosphere and also down at the ocean surface. And that is the hallmark of low pressure, a, a clockwise circulation in the southern hemisphere. And of course, Low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds get traction on the ocean surface and generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turn into swell. They get groomed out and turn into swell. Swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So it all starts with a trough. We have a trough right here in the South Pacific. Uh, New Zealand there, Australia there, Antarctica here. Ross, the ice line about, what, 64 south, something like that. So that area right there looks promising, but the winds are not blowing very hard. We saw the seas that were being generated 23, 24 feet, not very inspirational. And as we get into Monday, that trough basically pinches off and does nothing. Then we get another trough developing. Let's go back here to like Tuesday or so under New Zealand. This one looking a little better with winds to 120 knots pushing off to the northeast. And that too continues off to the east, but generally pretty weak, doesn't have a lot of energy. Now, for the most part, Earlier this year, we were seeing all the energy. When all the energy is up in the northern branch of the jet, that really doesn't do anything to create swell production. You need the energy down here. We're getting into this pattern again where the northern branch of the jet has all the energy, southern branch weaker, and that just doesn't do a whole lot for storm or swell production. As we get into Friday the 15th, another little trough tries to organize. It fades out. Saturday, everything sort of falls apart again. Now we get a good flow as we get into Sunday. We're a week out again. Don't believe the model's out a week. But uh, with 150 knot winds pushing under Australia and to the tip of New Zealand, maybe some hope there. We'll just have to watch it. But it doesn't look super promising on this chart as of right now. 
So let's get down to the surface. Surface level pressure and surface level winds. It is wind blowing on the ocean surface that makes waves. The jet stream winds just support surface level gales. So that's where we start. They're a good indicator of whether there's a foundation for the gale. You have to have a foundation in the upper atmosphere. But at the end, you got to have winds on the ocean surface or you're not getting any seas. All right. So as of right now, Sunday, high pressure east of New Zealand, 1036 millibar. This weak little diffuse gale of some sort, was it a 968 millibar uh, low here, but kind of all fragmented. There's your 30 knot winds aim north, and that's really not enough you need pretty much 40 knot winds over a good size area. So we get into Monday, that all falls apart. The new low starts building under New Zealand. Yes, there's fetch here, but it's pretty much all over ice and not of any interest. So we're stuck with this 35 knot fetch aimed off to the northeast here. Tuesday, that continues. We get this broad pattern of 30 to 35 knot winds, little core to 40, but you need a broader core than that. It tries again into Tuesday night and Wednesday, but mainly 30 to 35 five knot winds then another fetch tries to organize over new zealand it falls apart and just a diffuse pattern yes there's 35 knot winds on friday they're all aimed to the south penguin storm there again now it tries on saturday this is looking much more interesting with 40 knot winds here and another 45 to 50 knot winds aimed off to the we'll say east northeast but they all are generally falling. The fetch areas are falling to the southeast. You need them pushing to the northeast. So they're pretty much going in the wrong direction. Sunday, a little gale, theoretically, uh, tries to organize east of New Zealand. But it, too, is pretty weak. And the model a week out is never reliable. So what's the effect of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, we know right now there's a little gale here not really doing anything. Of course, it dissolves. We know there's another system forecast pushing under New Zealand. We just saw it. Seas only 20, maybe 24 feet and a couple of little pockets. Uh, and mainly in the 23-foot range, no hope there. And then we know there's smatterings of other little fetch trying to organize. Here we go into Saturday, but this falling southeast, yes. And this other low, let's see if it lasts. Has a little area, 30 to 32-foot seas, maybe lifting northeast, but we'll see. Week out, not really believable. And then just for fun, a quick look at the Northern Hemisphere jet stream. Uh, we were hoping that it would wake up, that it would be strong, that El Nino would be influencing it and driving it, but that doesn't appear to be the case. Here we are in September, things, if the if El Nino was really getting a firm grip on the atmosphere, we'd be seeing it now. Part of this is also, we think, the delay of the seasons. We're still trying to beat the last little hangovers of La Nina. Um, so we're just blasting through the jet stream model here. We see a little bit of a trough trying to organize Tuesday. Being fed by, uh, not bad, 140 knot winds at one point there. Maybe possibly doing something. And then some more as we get into Saturday with uh, 140 knot winds. So not looking horrible, but not looking off the charts either. Uh, if anything, late getting traction this year. And just a quick jump, the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. Again, we want to see 20, at least 20-foot seas. I'm um, into Tuesday, Wednesday here. We're just looking for anything. Yeah, we know there's fetch here. The jet stream looked good, but nothing is lasting long enough to even generate 20-foot seas. 20-foot seas would be this like the first little peach color here, and it's just not doing it, and that's it. So nothing for the North Pacific for the coming week. So then we start looking for the potential for wind swell. See, low pressure here in the Gulf of Alaska. And yes, this is Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, Southern California down here in the Baja. Remnants of Hova and Hawaii here. We see some fetch, 20 knots, but that's, or even, even up to 30 knots for a second as of 
now, but that quickly fades as we get into Monday. Hova fades out. High pressure builds in. The typical gradient, it's not even a summertime pressure gradient. It's just a nondescript kind of worthless pressure gradient pushing down the coast, generating 20-knot winds along the California coast. Light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, that'll generate some wind swell. Light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Wednesday, same deal. So we get into Thursday, the gradient moves up off of northern in California. Winds uh, start to dissipate for most of North, Central, and of course all of Southern California. Light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, rel relatively light wind pattern for California. Again, Fetch trying to get a foothold in the Gulf of Alaska, not doing it. Light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. We're into Saturday, light wind regime, and both in Hawaii and California. We get into Sunday, more of the same. Just Nothing real obvious in terms of wind swell production or in terms of tropics and uh, nothing in the Gulf of Alaska of any meaningful value. So that gets us to the surf forecast. We're going to start in Half Moon Bay, good representation for Northern California. So it looks like basically wind swell in the two to three to maybe four foot range on Tuesday. Let's go take a look here. Swell heights and swell periods. Heights. It's pretty much five feet, five feet or less down to two feet at, you know, six, seven seconds, maybe even eight seconds. Notice there's a little peak here of southern hemi swell starting to come in on uh, late on Tuesday, early Wednesday. But the wind swell pretty much bearing all that. Let's go look in southern California. It'll tell the tale of the southern hemi swell. We go to Dana Point. We see uh, wave heights of or surf heights of three feet fading down. And then as we get into Wednesday, they come up to about three and a half feet. That's for a standard break, just like a sand bottom, no special bathymetry, no reef, anything like that. Uh, this could be easily one and a half times this size at top spots. Uh, swell heights, two feet at 10 to nine seconds. That's the pure, that's the leftover Hova swell, some wind swell. Then here we go. Southern Hemi swell arriving Wednesday morning in the two to two and a half foot range at 16 to 15 seconds and slowly fading out as we get through the weekend. So at least surf midweek and into the weekend beyond. For Oahu, unfortunately not as rosy a picture. We see surf heights in about the two foot range at that, and then even smaller. Looking at doing the swell analysis, oh, one and a half to two feet. Pieces of energy at 15 to 16 seconds, falling down to 11 and 12 seconds. Background swell energy probably emanating from somewhere south of the islands, but pretty nondescript. If it's kind of like this hit or miss type thing, it's not a strong swell. Yes, you can go out on a longboard, catch some waves, have fun, but no serious surf expected. And that sets us up to go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden Julian Oscillation and the El Nino Southern Oscillation? These two oscillations are the major influencers of swell producing surf and snow in the Pacific Basin, mainly in winter months, but they also have an effect during summer months as well. We're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation. It has two phases, the active and inactive phase. It, they, these two phases rotate, they're like a weather system that rotates from west to east around the planet on the equator. The active phase on one side of the planet, the inactive phase on the other, rotating like that. It is the active phase that is good for enhancing storms and producing surf. The active phase is like a low pressure system. The inactive phase does the exact opposite. It's a high pressure system and it stomps on storm production. When the active phase moves into the far west Pacific, what it does is takes warm moist energy down at the ocean surf surface, lifts it high aloft, and that gets caught by the jet stream. It feeds energy into the jet stream and a stronger energy, a stronger jet stream helps create troughs, Troughs create storms, and storms create surf. Also, the active phase of the MJO uh, 
helps dampen trade winds, and especially you want that over the far west Pacific, and it dampens the trades on the equator, and if it's strong enough, it can actually reverse the trade winds. That allows warm water that's normally pushed into the far west Pacific, driven there by steady trade winds, to start moving east under the equator, not on the ocean surface, but under the equator in a thing known as a Kelvin wave. So if you have a strong active phase of the MJO and it dampens the trade winds, it can create a Kelvin wave. That Kelvin wave takes eh, about four months to make its way across the Pacific under the equator. Eventually that ball of warm water will erupt as it impacts the Galapagos and into Ecuador and create a warm water slick there. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, and the MJO typically goes active for like four to six weeks, inactive for four to six weeks, and then active again for four to six weeks. So if you get multiples of these active phases of the MJO queued up and traversing the Pacific, they can create multiple Kelvin waves as balls of warm water. And that eventually starts all building up off of Ecuador. And that then starts changing the jet stream pattern because warm water off of Ecuador starts creating evaporation over in the far west Pacific, which the planet is not used to seeing. That is the hallmark of El Nino. And then as that ocean pattern gets coupled with the atmosphere above it, you end up with El Nino. That is our current situation right now. We are waiting. We have piles of warm water over in the far east equatorial Pacific. We're waiting for signs that the atmosphere is getting coupled and being significantly changed by that warm water pattern that has been there now for months off of Ecuador. We think it's happening, but the point of this presentation here is to really dig in and see how coupled the atmosphere is or whether it's not that coupled. But for right now, let's start by looking at MJO status. All right, data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino, but they also have wind sensors on them. That's very good because we're looking for signs of decreased trade winds in the West Pacific. So this is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here, the equator right there, the date line right there. That is New Guinea. We're looking at the arrows. The longer the arrow and the direction of the arrow, the stronger the wind. So strong East trades in the East Pacific, pretty strong East trades in the Central Pacific. They weren't there a week ago. And now pretty strong East winds over the Kelvin wave generation area. This area in the West Pacific where when the active phase is here and the trades are suppressed, this is where you get the production of Kelvin waves. Now, it's not the actual wind speeds that matter, though. It's the anomaly, the difference from normal for this time of year. Looking over here in the East Pacific, we see light easterly winds stronger than normal. And I think in reality, this sort of understates what's going on here. My guess is these winds are actually blowing pretty hard in this area. And you'll see why I say that in a couple of minutes. Uh, over the Central Pacific, winds pretty much normal. And in the Kelvin wave generation area, winds out of the east, but very slightly, not very strong. So probably though, this looks like an inactive phase of the MJO, or at least not an active phase. What have winds been doing in the West Pacific the past five days? Well, we can look at it right here. 850 millibar vector wind anomalies. It's uh, So this is at 850 millibars. That's up about 4,700 feet, but it's a good proxy for what's going on at the surface. There is South America, Chile, Peru, Central America, Hawaii there, New Guinea there, the equator there. Dateline there, the all-important Kelvin wave generation area here, September 4th, the blues, easterly anomalies. You can barely see the arrows there. Uh, again, weak easterly anomalies on the 5th. I mean, a little pocket of westerly anomalies here, but mainly east anomalies dominating, sort of a mixed bag as of September 8th. So no strong west anomalies, but not super strong east anomalies either. Almost a neutral pattern. Zonal wind anomalies for the next two weeks, all right? So this is the whole planet on one chart. Uh, the date line runs right up the middle. 
Far West Pacific starts about 125 east, so right along that line there. Kelvin Wave Generation Area, that's where we're really interested. So from 125 east to about 170 west, this box right in here. The blues are easterly anomalies, inactive phase of the MJO. So you can see we had westerly anomalies in some degree through about the end of August. Then east anomalies started setting up. The model's been projecting this. Notice we still have westerly anomalies here on the uh, date line and forecast continuing into oh maybe the 17th or 18th of september then backing off a little bit with a pretty good chunk of westerly anomalies forecast setting up on the date line by the 25th of september so that's two weeks out and the models this model's been all over the place but generally speaking this easterly pattern is supposed to be short-lived a week or two. We're about a week into it now, and it looks like maybe another week and a half or so before it breaks up, according to this model. Here is another view of that. Uh, so the Galapagos there, Ecuador there, uh, New Guinea there. This is 140 east. Uh, the equator runs right across here. Kelvin wave generation area right in this area here. We'll just run through this real quick. This is a two-week run. Oh, the oranges are westerly anomalies. That's what we want to see. The blues, easterly anomaly. So this suggests westerly anomalies holding, holding, looking reasonably decent we're into the 18th of september continuing on some degree of westerly anomalies but see there's still 20 degrees off here to the left that we're not seeing that probably are easterly anomalies and then things get a little bit weak there we go they come back again um, we're also looking at the easterly pattern off of Ecuador, that's going to come into play. So we'll just play this whole thing through again. Westerly anomalies looking reasonable through till about 21st of September. They break up a bit, then they come back pretty quickly after that. So sort of a mixed bag of east and westerly anomalies. Let's do one other look here. This is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. The west component of the wind, orange there. Let's see if we can do this. This is from the GFS model and a Kelvin wave generation area starting right about here, going over to about here. This suggests westerly anomalies pretty much holding in some fashion in the Kelvin wave generation area till about the 16th of September. And this only goes out 10 days, I believe it is, and then fading some. The GEFS model, pretty much painting the same picture. And then the ECMWF model, the European model, says West Anomalies pretty much holding the whole way through the 10-day model run. So the GFS is probably the most pessimistic. The, EC, the Euro model, probably the most optimistic. Maybe we'll end up somewhere in between. Let's keep digging. Another component of the MJO, the active phase, is cloud cover. If the active phase of the MJO is low pressure system, low pressure systems take warm moist air lifted aloft, it hits colder air aloft, condenses, forms clouds. This model is a representation of cloud cover. This is a statistic model. Uh, again, South America, Central America, Hawaii, Australia, New Guinea, equator right there, dateline right there. We're looking for the active phase or some version of it in the West Pacific right here, Kelvin Wave Generation Area. According to the statistic model, uh, the blue is less outgoing long wave radiation. That means sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface. It gets obscured by clouds, so you get negative anomalies. So this means more cloud cover. Roughly the active phase of the MJO says today it's there building and building and building two weeks out. That looks good. The GEFS model, though, says active phase weak and weakening and turning almost inactive two weeks from now. So the two models, there's the outcome two weeks out, and there's the opposite outcome. So the two models are considerably divergent in their views. So we can drill into those two models. This is the statistic model. This is the dynamic model. This is called a phase diagram. It's a way to get a more detailed view of exactly where the active phase is and how strong it is. The dot right here is the active phase. But how do you read this? Well, the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, 
uh, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot, the further it is away from the circle, the stronger the active phase is. So you want to see it in the West Pacific, up in here, very strong. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, and not to be too dismayed by these charts, is during El Nino, the active phase sort of disappears and becomes absorbed into the El Nino base state. And El Nino itself is like a month, months long running active phase of the MJO. All right. We're not there yet. But when the atmosphere in the ocean get, gets coupled, that's what happens. So, and the active phase is, of course, a storm generating machine. So that's what we want to see. Right now, active phase, though, in the so far eastern Indian Ocean, western maritime continent. And the, the closer the dot is to the circle, the weaker it is. So a modestly weak active phase of the MJO. Three different runs. Well, one says it moving into the West Pacific and looking pretty strong uh, two weeks from now. Two others just saying it decaying and being incredibly weak in the West Pacific. The dynamic model, the GFS model, says no, the active phase just crashing back into the NA. Ocean, Indian Ocean and curling up in a ball and hiding from itself. So no hope there. The upper level model. This is an, another version that shows you potential for precipitation. The green wet air, the orange dry air. It's suggesting today, oh, how do you read this? There's South America, Central America, equator right there, dateline roughly there, New Guinea there, active phase, this is the Kelvin wave generation area right here, active phase over the Kelvin wave generation area, moving east and east and out of the picture by at the end of September with the inactive phase coming in, taking over the whole way through to the end of October and then the active phase returns. So no real hope there unless you believe this is doing something. But again, this is a statistic model. I think it's overhyping the uh, active phase some. Now, if that seems a little bit depressing, that's not the whole picture. It's one side of the story. The CFS model paints a completely different picture. All right, again, this is back to the east-west component of the winds, the reds, or we want to see westerly anomalies. And let's go the date line right there. So Kelvin wave generation area starts right about here, 125 east, goes to about 180. This is past performance here. Dotted contour, inactive phase, Solid contour active phase. You can see this big blast of westerly anomalies started about mid-July. Kind of pretty much has gone non-stop the whole way through August. Now here we are, this dotted contour, I'll call it like the inactive phase of an equatorial Rossby wave. That's what's driving these easterly anomalies. It is not the inactive phase of the MJO. I mean, you can see the inactive phase over here, but over in the Kelvin wave generation area, that's not really what's going on. And even better yet, this model suggests these easterly anomalies maybe are to hold through today and starting about the 10th or 11th, they start building on the dateline. Yes, the easterly anomalies hold in some fashion in the far, far west Pacific, but over the dateline, westerly anomalies building to almost strong status in a couple of days, and then basically holding nonstop, filling the whole Kelvin wave generation area as we get into the beginning of October, the end of September. So a much better picture here. And then if you don't like what a model shows a month out, let's go three months out. This is a long range CFS model. Let's get ourselves our end date line right here. Now the forecast is up here. What has happened is down here. All right, Kelvin wave generation area starts here about 125 east and goes over to about 170 west here. So here we are today. Now this is uh, outgoing long wave radiation, cloud cover. The blues are cloudy skies, so that would be low pressure. The reds and oranges, clear skies, high pressure, all right? And starting literally today, this model suggests a building clouded pattern over the date line. And you can see it just getting stronger and stronger and stronger as we get into December as cloud-free drought conditions set up over the maritime continent. This is classic El Nino sort of pattern. And you can see the beginnings of that, this cloud-free pattern 
down building since, oh, even into, I'd say, July in earnest, maybe even before that. And we've gotten some reports from some of our viewers that live in Australia, and they say, yeah, things are pretty dry here. And it only looks like it's going to get more so that way. And you can see the weekly building cloud cover pattern setting up over the dateline. I think the model is probably grossly overhyping this, at least in the short term, but it still looks favorable. And then we switch over to the westerly, east-west component of the wind pattern. It tells the exact same story. It's like the last of the easterly anomalies are moving over the maritime continent pretty much starting today. Westerly anomalies start building, give it the 12th or the 13th. Little pretty good little burst here, maybe on the 15th of September. That's only five days out. You can see as we get into the latter part of September, the whole way into November and even December, just mega westerly anomalies forecast. Again, I don't believe a model a week out, much less three months out, but this model's done a reasonably good job. And you can see it here westerly anomalies building on the dateline, while easterly anomalies are already building over the maritime continent. And all this is basically saying is that pattern is going to continue and get even stronger as we get into the fall season. The real kicker here, the key is the seasonal transition. We think the seasons are delayed. We said six weeks. I still think it's going to be the end of September. I mean, this literally says the end of September, and all of a sudden the El Nino machine comes to life, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to sort of sit in this netherland trying to pick for little signs of things that are coming or working in our favor, and then all of a sudden the dam's going to break, and boom, it's going to open up, and things are going to start happening. I think we're poised to do that. Let's overlay the MJO here. All right, dotted contour, inactive phase of the MJO. It's in control. We're two days from it peaking, but right about the time it peaks and starts fading, that's when the westerly anomalies start kicking in. Then the active phase builds on top of that. That constructively interferes with the El Nino base state. state, state. That's like two waves sinking up together. They amplify each other, and boom, you get these me mega westerly anomalies. And then by then, the atmosphere and the ocean are coupled. The inactive phase of the MJO forecast by the end of September cannot hold back the tide, and we're in the running then. Let's overlay the low-pass filter. Here's where things get really interesting. So, the solid contour is a low pressure bias. It's the El Nino signal. The dotted contour is the La Nina signal. So we're here wringing our hands going, gosh, is El Nino coming? I just don't know. When you look at this, yeah, you know, this is actually what's happened. One, two, three contours of low pressure bias already in play on the dateline, and they've been there since July. You think it's going to be denied? Not a chance. We're just waiting for the seasons to kick over. A little push, and all this is going to go nuts. Now, notice, three contours, four contours. And this wasn't supposed to happen until maybe in November. Now the model's saying the 28th of October, and just today, now I don't even believe this, a fifth contour starting around Thanksgiving time. If this were to happen, this would be great news. And what's even more interesting is the high pressure bias right here. It was not originally supposed to dissipate. It's right now basically over top of, or uh, oh, under California on the equator, it wasn't even supposed to get ramped up to like oct or fade out till October 18th. Now the model is continually saying it's getting weaker and weaker. They're saying in another week and a half, the high pressure bias is going to be gone completely. We're fully in business if you believe this model. And one quick look, outgoing long-wave radiation actuals, okay, not from models, just another view of that, okay, what has happened is up here, this is, there is no forecast, this is just all actuals. The oranges and reds, clear skies, high pressure, the dateline runs right up the middle here, and wet or cloudy skies over the maritime continent back in, this was last year during the peak. So this is the clear La Nina signal, dry in the Pacific, wet over the maritime continent. Then we got to somewhere in late June, you see the wet anomalies building 
on the dateline. Today, not so much. And you see the dry air, which was here on the dateline, backfilling over the maritime continent. The pattern is changing, just not as quick as we'd like. It's like, it's really feeling like this El Nino might be very late in evolving, which maybe isn't a bad thing. All right, enough of the MJO thing. What's going on in the ocean, all right? Subsurface temperatures, data from the TAO buoy array, those series of buoys that are strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are sensors on those anchor lines. The sensors collect data, use a model to fill in the copious gaps in between. And you get a profile of, remember we were talking about Kelvin waves. Are Kelvin waves present? Are they moving from west to east? And if they are, where is the balance of warm water in the Pacific? So actual temperatures, the 30 degree isotherm, 30 degrees centigrade, making some progress. It was 171 west, now moving to about 168 uh, west, suggesting warm water moving to the east. The 29 degree isotherm, same sort of deal. It's been hanging about 166, 165. Maybe it's at 164 today. 28 degree isotherm well, has been locked at 140 for like forever. Now it is on the move as well to about 137 west. The 24 degree isotherm right here well, was down at 50 meters deep, then went up to 25 was at 37 more recently, losing a little bit of ground, but not a lot. But it is not the actual temperatures. It is the anomaly, difference from normal for this time of year. What we clearly have is piles of warm water in the East Pacific, three, four, five degrees above normal. This wasn't here even last week. I think it was only four degree anomalies. So warming pattern in the East Pacific and even more so, we've talked about this before, another Kelvin wave that was generated from that spurt of westerly anomalies in the July and early August time frame, still quite present, downwelling Kelvin wave, warm water falling to depth and then making its way across the Pacific. There is months of warm water in the hopper here, suggesting that even if our El Nino is a little bit late in getting going, it's got, well, let's say three to four months, four months from now, we'll just say September to October, November, December, January. We're into mid-January before the warm water pool gets tapped out subsurface, and still all this warm water is going to be on the surface just building and building. So, this looks pretty good. Now, we normally go look at this, uh, the Pentad's uh, data, but it hasn't updated since August 26, so we're going to ignore it. I think it's not that the it's satellite-based data, and it certainly is collecting data. I think this is more just a function of NOAA's website not updating correctly, and they'll get on it at some point and resolve it. But the good news is my favorite chart actually has been updating. Equatorial upper ocean heat anomalies. This is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. It just shows you the balance of where the warm and the cool water are. All right, back a year ago, October 22nd, or 2022, lots of warm water in the West Pacific, lots of cold water in the East Pacific. And you just go down to now and you see everything's totally flipped, suggesting El Nino. You can see Kelvin wave number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five, though Noah, uh, I went and looked at them, and they said there's only been four Kelvin waves, uh, but they sort of took these two and mashed them together, but they were two distinct, separate west wind anomaly events that created those, so I'm going to say there's five here, the five that got us into El Nino, building up all the warm water in the East Pacific, and then number six here, you see, again, piles of warm water, this is one to one and a half degrees to two, uh, one and a half to two degrees here, filling this whole basin, and this is, again, this is over, averaged over 300 meters, the temperatures are actually much warmer down below. So all looking very good at this point in time. So what's going on at the surface? All right, not unexpectedly, lots of warm water. Uh, here is Chile, Peru, Ecuador, the Galapagos, Central America, Hawaii out here. 
uh, piles of warm water along Ecuador and Peru, though not nearly as distinct and as warm as a week ago. Well, where is all that warm water going? Well, it's really a function of east anomalies over this area. You know, we saw the charts. We saw the east anomalies filling the Kelvin wave generation area. They're also happening off of Ecuador. That creates some mixing and stirring up. And so these temperatures start looking not as warm as they are. We believe this is a total fake out and things are much warmer than that than what they appear here. The good news is we see this orange colors building out to... 150, maybe even 152 west. The, the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, starts at 120, so a point south of California, five degrees north and south of the equator, out to 170, so right here. You can see we have warm water filling everything but the last 20 degrees here and that's warm but it's not just not as warm as what's here and certainly not as warm as what's over here so basically our el nino looks fine we've also been monitoring this patch of cool water which has been like hugging all california and uh you know that that was all during spring when we had all those strong north winds the north winds have abated the ocean is cooking the ocean surface and you can see that clearly reflected here with much warmer temperatures now above average temperatures some of this will get mixed up a little bit here in the coming week in the coming eh, it's actually only three or four days probably won't lose too much warm here and as soon as the winds subside here in the next couple of days boom this will cook right back up notice we, we're warm the whole way out now this is a pretty shallow area of warm water here it's not like this here but it can fuel storm development but my guess is the first couple of cold fronts that come through will really mix this up and then it won't be so obvious but this cool patch here continuing to erode slowly dissipating this is just again high if high pressure centered right here right now not as close to california not as strong as it's been the seasons are changing but you have dead air in the center of a high pressure so the sun can bake the ocean surface this clearly reflects that but on the south side of the high you get the uh that'd be northeast winds limited now to just this stretch off of Southern California to a point south and, and moving southwest to Hawaii. So La Nina signal still present, but fading. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. All right, so South America, Ecuador right there, the equator right there, that's all that really matters. So for a week right in this area, we had blues, colder, temperatures getting colder that was all attributable to easterly anomalies in that er this area we think those easterly anomalies are starting to fade some temperatures are almost neutral warming very weak warming basically a neutral pattern here's again that the you know the uh what would you call it uh, the center of the high pressure and the warming of the ocean surface right here and up to, into northern california but basically everything holding status quo for right now and then the backed off view, of course, again, the clear El Nino signal right there with all supporting warm water north and south of it. The El Nino triangle in control hangover of our La Nina right there. But again, the other takeaway is you just see how warm the entire uh, pl uh oceans of the planet are a lot of this is because we haven't had an el nino in a while some of it's because of the tonga volcano spewing lots of uh a water vapor up into the atmosphere that acts like a greenhouse gas traps heat and so you get even more cooking and then some of it is just the planet warming but you can see not a whole lot of cold water anywhere Drilling in, sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there by Ecuador. Current value plus 2.2 degrees centigrade above normal right there. Now you see we were much higher. We were at above 3 degrees in late September or uh, early, I mean late August, early September. Again, this is that east anomaly thing. We think the base state here, if you didn't have a bunch of wind blowing, it would be holding right at about 3 degrees above. So plenty of warm water in control. Now, the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 area, again, on the equator from a point south of California out to about the dateline, temperatures, the trend steadily creeping upwards, plus 1.214 degrees. All right. 
Uh, El Nino, the beginnings of El Nino is a half a degree for five consecutive three months periods. So we're, this is the threshold for a weak El Nino. Moderate El Nino starts at one degree. We are in that area now. Strong El Nino starts at one and a half degree and super El Nino starts at two degrees. So where do you think we're going? This is another neat little chart, just shows sea surface temperature anomalies. Now this is right here, that's Ecuador over there, that's the far west Pacific. You can just see the building expanse of the warm temperatures as those Kelvin waves erupt to the surface. The building El Nino footprint, you can see, what is this? This is one degree anomalies, I believe, right here, this line, going the whole way out to uh, past the date line. So the El Nino signal continuing to build, we expect that will continue. This is not going to dissipate. So let's do a quick comparison of our current El Nino state as compared to uh, two other super El Ninos in the past. Here we are, September 9th. You can see the warm pattern. Now, again, this is actually muted by easterly anomalies. Here is, I think I can pull this up. Here is what we were at last week. So you can see the difference between the two. Um, just the easterly winds took, take some of the deep reds out of here. Okay. But even at that, let's compare this to 2015 at this point in time. 9th of September, 2015. And here's where we are today. We're still blowing that away. And then we compare to 1997. Well, 97 at this time clearly is blowing us away, even if you use the most optimistic picture, which was last week. Yeah, can't compare to that. But I went and looked at everything else from 97 up to today, and there's nothing that can touch this El Nino at this current point in time other than the 97 El Nino. So we're still doing quite good. And remember, 97 was a super El Nino. And also, where is it? 2015 turned into a super El Nino too. So we're in good company. Ocean surface currents. We can look at that as well here. So there is New Guinea, Philippines there, uh, the maritime continent, all the little islands. Notice all the cooking warm water in here. Winds and the current taking that warm water, dragging it off to the east. Now, this is just winds and uh, this is current here, the actual current on the ocean surface driven by winds. OK, but it doesn't turn on a dime. This suggests persistent westerly anomalies have made a mark and set up a steady uh, transport current on the ocean surface to some point here. Now, let's go over and look the other way. Here is Ecuador, and there we go, Galapagos there. We have an eastward current there, okay? Um, we're, we've talked about the Walker circulation in the past. It's basically like a chimney that sets up over the Pacific with wind and current flowing into it from here and from here creates a big load, the low pressure bias we talked about, and we think it is right there where that dot is, which is at 163 west. We think that's the convergence point of these two currents. Maybe it could be over here at 166, but either way, somewhere almost south of Hawaii is the center of, we think, is a developing walker circulation, the coupling of the ocean and the atmosphere. This is our be best bit of evidence between this and the outgoing long wave radiation models. Now the surface, things look good. It's the upper atmosphere that we're not seeing the outgoing long wave radiation pattern looking as strong as we want it to be. But again, the consideration is we think we are delayed in the seasons. And even for that walker circulation to be getting really strong in September would probably be a little bit on the optimistic side, except for the strongest of El Ninos. All right, so what does the atmosphere think is going on? This is, again, some actually very good news. The Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, which is the maritime continent, and Tahiti, which is clearly in the Pacific, both of them roughly on the equator. When pressure is lower on average in Tahiti 
than as compared to Darwin, the index goes negative. Wow, minus 21.57. We're not even in the active phase of the MJO, and we're down at minus 21.57. And look at this. We've been just negative for quite a long time. Uh, I think it's 27 days or something like that. This is looking good. In fact, it's looking very good. The 30-day average, minus 9.31. Not as deep as we'd like it. We were down lower. This is heavily influenced by the MJO. When the active phase of the MJO moves over, it really can dip this. But let's just sort of go back. We're minus 13.46. We're at minus 9.31. And because things have been falling so much lately, we think this is going to... Well, you can see it. It's it's We sort of topped out at minus 8.71 and now we're starting to head down we think we're going to go down deeper than that 90 day average not that great minus 6.85 oh by the way we'd want to see this down at minus 25 at like a peak of el nino and this at minus like 15 during the peak of el nino we're at minus 6.85 the trend eh, pretty much holding steady more or less so no clear sign of el nino yet but again this runs almost three months behind whatever's happening right now, but we know, looking at the surface, we're right on the cusp of something happening in terms of the Walker circulation getting set up. The d dam is poised to break, but I'm not going to say it's breaking yet because it isn't. It's just all the fundamentals are there. Here's a 30-day moving SOI. Again, positive territory, La Nina, negative ter territory, El Nino. During La Nina, you can see, oh, and the, the downward spikes are the active phase, the MJO. The upward spikes, the inactive phase. During La Nina, the inactive phase, high pressure, took control of the Pacific. Then starting January of this year, boom, the first major just, well, it was really one, two, three massive active phases of the MJO dropped us way down. We kind of lost ground. Here we are toggling around somewhere around the 10 range waiting for the next big pulse of whatever. And I think what it's going to be is the Walker circulation taking control. The MJO will completely disappear and then we'll be off to the races. We're poised to do that. And then finally, the forecast for sea surface temperature anomalies in the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino Montan region, from the CFS version 2, which is pretty consistent with most of the other dynamic models. So here we are in August, September, right in here. Temperature supposedly uh, 1.4 degrees above normal. We're in the high medium state trying to move into strong El Nino status. I think what we're really waiting for is the Walker circulation to uh, take control, signaling a coupling of the ocean and the atmosphere. And that, I think, is attributable to just we need a push in the change of the season to get us there. The forecast has, by October, right on the cusp of uh, strong medium to weak, strong uh, 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 El Nino and then as we get into November, now this has gone down. At one point, this is suggested temperatures up at 2.2. And then even last week, I think it was, no, the week before it was 1.9 and then about 1.85. Now it's toggled down to about 1.75, still strong El Nino, and then holding into January, slow, slowly tapering off from there. The PDF corrected, I consider this the low side of the forecast range, says temperatures only getting to about 1.45 degrees above normal. So somewhere, and that in uh, maybe December. So somewhere between 1.45 and 1.75. I think I'm going to go more on the high side and say, if this thing, it's really a function of when this thing gets its act together. When will the Walker circulation kick in? The longer it waits, probably the better the odds that we don't hit as high of a temperature. Uh, that said, I think in a week or two, we should be there. So I, I, I'm favoring more of this, but let me know what you think. I mean, we've talked about this and, and most everyone has already put their bets on the table. But if you have a different opinion, lay it out. Let's see. All right, so let's reel this all in. For right now, small southern hemi swell working its way to the north, impact or scheduled to impact mainly California, uh, certainly down into Costa Rica, Central America, Peru, 
uh, but hitting California mid of this coming week and continuing through the work week and even into the weekend. So fun size surf, something to ride for sure. And with a bit more power, more period than Hova, that's a good thing. Looking further out, nothing clear on the charts, either north or south, maybe something under New Zealand, but you know, the models, they're not very encouraging, at least in the short term. We are moving towards the seasonal transition. It would not be surprising to see the southern hemisphere slowly starting to come offline. We want to see the northern hemisphere come online. We don't see it, but I think we're going to hit some magic spot somewhere in about the next two to three weeks where all of a sudden the atmosphere goes Time for seasonal transition. The North Pacific jet stream will wake up and we'll end up with a real gale somewhere up there, probably in the northern Gulf. And then we'll start to move slowly into an El Nino-based configuration with the Walker circulation also building off the seasonal change and getting more established. And once, once that happens, the storm machine will quickly kick into gear and things will get going. That said, I don't think we're going to have an early start to fall. I was really hoping that we would earlier this year, but we've just been in this stalled pattern for a while. So we're not there as of yet. But I think we're moving in the right direction. Give it a week or two. All right, looking beyond that, well, all this winter, theoretically, pretty good surf. More rainfall than normal expected for the California coast, provisionally, maybe, all dependent on El Nino. And more snowfall than normal, but with higher snow elevations or because of the warmth that's typically associated with El Nino. All this could change, but the southern tier states across the entire United States should see more precipitation than normal and snowfall into Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah and those areas. So, things provisionally looking pretty good. We're not quite there yet. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't, ring the bell, like, and subscribe. Uh, you get automatic notifications when the videos are posted. If you want to send us a contribution, that would be welcome. Use the special thanks button down below. And one note, there will not be a video, I know, again next week. Okay, it's the last of these. After that, we should be consistent every week on Sundays. But, you know, people do have to have a life every now and then. So, with that said, that's it for this week. We'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for watching.